We were wondering if maybe you had experienced any disturbances lately. What, what kind of disturbance? Oh, you know, like uh, dishes or furniture moving around by themselves. I don't want no volunteers. I don't want no mates. There's too many captains on this island. $10,000 for me by myself. For that, you get the head, the tail, the whole damn thing. It's not as if she were a, a maniac, a raving thing. She just goes a little mad sometimes. We all go a little mad sometimes. Haven't you? Oh, and Senator, just one more thing. Love your suit. From the haunted heartland in Omaha, Nebraska, this is Brian Corey, and I welcome you one and all to this episode of the Necronomicast, bringing you the horror of Hollywood and beyond. My guest tonight for a late night conversation is Dr. Lee Miller, PhD. He's a Canadian best-selling author, criminologist, and profiler, specializing in homicide and sex crimes. He's a lecturer, a singer-songwriter, and an author. And the focus of our conversation tonight is his recent book that was almost tailor-made for this show. It's entitled, Behind the Horror, True Stories That Inspired Horror Movies. We're gonna talk about the real life events that inspired movies like Jaws, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, The Exorcist Psycho, Silence of the Lambs, and more. So I invite you to dim the lights, settle in, and enjoy this late night conversation with Dr. Lee Miller. And now calling in on the Necronomicast hotline in the land of Liverpool, England, Dr. Lee Meller. How are you doing? I'm doing good now. How are you? <laughs> I'm doing fine. It's great to, it's great to uh, make your acquaintance and to talk to uh, for the show. The origin of the show, uh, back when we started like 10 years ago, was talking about horror movies and the literature that inspired horror movies. And then we started talking about things that inspired horror movies. So we talk about paranormal and things like that to kind of show what informs the uh, writers of Hollywood. But you took it and wrote a book all about true stories that inspired horror movies. And so it's like tailor-made for this show. So I'm really excited to have you as part of the program. Right. And disclaimer, I didn't pick the topic. The publisher approached me with it. So if they've been listening to your show and getting ideas. That's not on me, man. <laughs> it's not on me. Hey, well, that's a it's a happy accident. That's great. Yeah, it's a it's a fun book, man. But tell me a little bit about yourself. Uh, I know you're Doctor Lee Miller. Yeah, just for brevity's sake, we'll say I'm a doctor of criminology. I study violent and sexual crime from an interdisciplinary perspective. That said, I'm not really part of the academy. I am more of an entrepreneur. I run a podcast called Murder Was the Case, in which I teach concepts during academy episodes. And more often, I do conversations with professionals, whether they be psychologists or criminologists or true crime writers or filmmakers or whatever. And I call those dive bars. And you can learn a lot from listening to those too. I'm coming up on 200th episode. I'm the author of, I think, uh, seven books right now. And two of them are academic. The other five are various degrees of, let's say, lighter public reading. But they're all nonfiction. Just started working on my first novel. And I had a music career in my 20s. At the peak, I was voted the third best singer-songwriter in Montreal. I'm also the vice president of the American Investigative Society of Cold Cases and the head of its behavioral committee. I think that's it. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Fantastic. And I man. don't have much money, by the way. <laughs> just sell the sell out. Just <laughs> don't be like me. <laughs> right. That's right. We don't need integrity. We just need money, right? Yeah. Yeah, you bet. <laughs> yeah. Well, we're making tons of money over here. We're printing money over here at the Necronomic Cast. So that's awesome. Mm. Uh I'm always looking for interesting people to talk to and, and in interesting topics to explore. And just through one of my internet searches, I came upon your book, Behind the Horror, True Stories That Inspired Horror Movies. And there's a copy of it right there. I've got mine 
right here glowing electronically. Mm. Fascinating book, man. I was reading through all these cases uh, that you document in here, many of them and many of the movies I haven't heard of before, or I've heard of them and I hadn't watched them before. So how did you sit down? I know you said the publisher approached you to, to put this together, but where did you begin like watching these movies and starting to take notes and, and start to write this book? How did that come about? Well, I've always been into horror movies, thriller movies. My Netflix profile has me down as dark, slow burn, psychological. And I think I've been like that my whole life, both in my entertainment choices and my identity, my own psychology, the things I'm interested in. And so they approached me with the idea. I guess they rightly picked, hey, this guy's probably going to be good for this. And they said, how would you like to write this book behind the horror about the true stories that inspired horror movies? And I was like, absolutely, I will do that. And they sent me a list with some ideas. And some of the films, I couldn't tell you which ones, but some of the films that made it into the book were on that list. Others weren't. So what I did was I kind of mentally sorted it by criteria. Knowing me, I made a list with little check boxes. And I would have put cinematic history importance plus how interesting is the story behind it plus how much do I personally like it. Those three things. And then I would have tabulated them and that's how I got the list of films that are in there. So I'm actually interested to know which films that you hadn't seen that were in there because I thought they were all reasonably mainstream. Oh yeah, they are. And I, you know, it's just kind of my ignorance or my, you know, it's my fault that I haven't seen a lot of these movies or some of these movies like uh, M, a city that searches for a murderer. Yeah. You can watch that on YouTube for free. Yeah. Yeah. I saw, I saw that. And so the next night that I have uh, some, some time, I'm definitely going to check that out because it has Peter Lorre and I'm a big Peter Lorre fan. Yeah, so it was directed by Fritz Lang, who is one of the great German expressionist filmmakers. And this was before Peter Lorre fled Germany. I mean, this is just on the cusp of the Nazis getting into power. Mm -hmm. And during the Weimar Republic, which was the republic that existed between the uh, post-Tsar Germany following the First World War and the rise to power of the Nazis in 1933. You had this Weimar Republic and there was all these serial murderers in there for some reason. Now, maybe we just didn't hear about as many under the Nazis or maybe during the First World War we were distracted, but I wouldn't be surprised if some of the social conditions enabled it in some way or, or gave rise to it. It's one of those chicken or egg questions. So yeah, in, in, the, in the book... I essentially write about the serial killers of Weimar Germany that inspired the conglomerate character of Hans, who is a serial child murderer in M. With that history, I didn't hear, I didn't know about a lot of these serial killers and like, like, like Carl Grossman and, and mm. uh, <laughs> some of these, I mean, even the term serial murder was first coined in German, but I mean, it was first coined and put together by, by an investigator in, in Germany at the time. Yeah. Ernst Gannat, he was the director of the Berlin police force. I think it was 1931. He put it together. It was the very early thirties because it was definitely in use for the time of the film. And Ernst Gannat had looked at the Peter Curtin case, the vampire of Dusseldorf, which is the one I explain in the most detail in the book. But also before that in Hanover, there was the case of Fritz Harman. And so then, yes, Grossman obviously would have been fresh in the memories from earlier on in Berlin, where Gannat was the director of police later. So he became aware of something in the zeitgeist that was mm -hmm. going on and he gave it a name. I know you, you, you wrote about all these, these guys in, in context of this film, but Carl Grossman, I think was the one that I was it really turned my stomach probably the most. I mean, you go into really good detail and, and not in like a gratuitous way, but I mean, you explain why these guys are just heinous serial killers and you explain the crimes. Um, so, but Carl Grossman, the butcher of Berlin 
to be getting off a train and have this guy selling sausages. <laughs> <laughs> And then like, oh, these are particularly meaty. They're pretty delicious. Yeah. I can't believe that story. And just thinking about how these people, when they picked up their picked up their newspapers and the news of the day and they're reading and they they like they're horrified that they traded a Deutschmark or over the currency of the time for this sandwich that was laden with um extra extra ingredients, so to speak. Yeah, there was a turning point in Grossman's business because Obviously, there were famines and such. This is during the Depression, which particularly hit Weimar Germany badly. They had massive inflation. Then these are the conditions which ultimately, one could argue, gave rise to the Nazis coming to power in some way. But you, there was a lot of poverty. And, you know, having like a meaty sausage was kind of a, a delicacy. So before that, he had these sort of like little withered, things made of turnips and fillers with maybe a dot or two of meat in there so you could justify it to yourself. And then one day they suddenly plump and juicy, like, oh, where does this meat come from? And I can't believe I'm getting them at this cost. And people are in such a rush to get on and off these trains. What happened was Grossman, he would look for people coming in from what would be called the provinces, so the countryside. And they thought, there's no work out here. Let's go to Berlin. Well, unfortunately, they didn't hear that there's no work in Berlin either. The whole country was screwed. And he knew that they would be coming into the city looking for opportunities, totally green, totally naive. And he would find these young women and approach them and say something like, you look lost. Do you need help? And, oh, I just came in from the countryside and I'm hoping to fine job as a maid or serving girl, something like that. And you go, oh my God, the coincidence. I, I was just on my way to the employment agency to find someone like that. Well, this must be fortune. How would you like to start at this? Come with me. I'll take you my place. He would then rape them, torture them, although what he did is unspecified. So I'll just put an asterisk beside that and kill them and then turn them into sausage meat and sell them to the people getting on and off the trains. You're right, it's absolutely hideous. The weird thing is it's by no means rare, although those other cases don't feature in the book, but it will have happened in your country too, probably at some point. <laughs> oh yeah, it's there's a lot of stories that bus stops and places like that are notorious for predators of all kinds. People mm -hmm. like young starlets going to Hollywood, wanting to make it, and they find unscrupulous people trying to cast them in porn films or, you know, other exploitative things and, and, and sex predators and, and uh, traffickers, you know, preying upon, you know, people that are very vulnerable. And so Carl Grossman definitely preyed <laughs> upon these people that were coming over to the, uh, into his area. So a lot of these, these stories have to do with cannibalism or, or, or things like that. Cause we were talking, or I was reading through your book and you know, there's the, the crimes of Ed Gein, not so much cannibal, but no, but rumored to be, but no hard evidence, no hard evidence of it, but he certainly um, used his victims in a different way. Yes. Yes. Once again, he denied that there was anything necrophilic about it. And I still don't really know because the guy was fairly psychotic. It might be something that is more akin to what has been termed necromania, which is like an obsession with the dead and corpses and skeletons and body parts. And so he was in Plainfield, Wisconsin in the kind of mid 50s. And he was the inspiration for Psycho the Norman Bates character for the family as a whole, I guess, but specifically Leatherface and the Texas Chainsaw Massacre and a partial inspiration for Buffalo Bill in the Silence of the Lambs. So do you want me to go through Ed Keen's bio in brief and then I can tie it into which facets went into each of those films? Oh, yeah. Yeah, let's talk about that for sure. Sure. Okay, so Ed Gein grew up in a extremely puritanical family in Wisconsin. His father was 
an alcoholic and just kind of not good for anything. And his mother vocalized this and made it well known to Ed and his brother, Henry, if I recall the name correctly, and would just say that he's a layabout. He's no good. You see, this is what drink does to people and uh, sex, women, same deal. She looked at this little town that they lived in at the beginning of their lives in Wisconsin, where probably nothing happened at all. They might've had like a movie theater or something like that. And she thought it was like Sodom and Gomorrah. So she had to get them out of there. So at one point they move out to this farmhouse in the countryside and it's on the outskirts of Plainfield, Wisconsin, where there is really, really nothing happening at all. Ed goes to school. He doesn't fit in. He is particularly uncomfortable around girls because his mother drills these erotophobic um, sort of ideas into him. He himself is kind of unusually effeminate and his father dies of I think it was alcoholism. And then for a brief period of time, it's him, his brother, Henry and his mother. Henry starts to say, you know, I don't know about mom. You know, I kind of don't want to live on this farm forever and just live under her thumb. Like I'd like to get married and have a family. And it's around this time that Ed and Henry go out to fight a fire on the property and Henry dies of smoke inhalation. Uh, okay, so Ed is the only one with him. Ed is the only one that's privy to this whispers of rebellion against the great matriarch. And when the police show up, the observations they make, there, there are some suspicious characteristics, but not quite enough to say it looks like Ed killed Henry. So now it's just Ed and Mother. I believe they're together for no longer than a year. And then Mother dies. And Ed is left with this giant farmhouse out in the middle of nowhere. He has no friends. He has no ability to really socialize with people. He obviously desires women in some way, but has been brainwashed from such a young age about the evils of them that psychologically he just can't navigate those waters. So even though he's not a psychopath, he has a lot of psychological problems and he has no support system and he's left in this house. And women in their 50s who resemble his mother, 50s, 60s, start to go missing. It's, it's not like boom, 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 a bunch. It's like in 1954, Bernice Warden goes, sorry, Mary Hogan goes missing from her tavern. And then the second time, Bernice Warden, who runs a local hardware store, this is years later, she is found to be missing. And her son, who is something like a sheriff's deputy, goes to investigate along with some other men. And they find blood on the floor, signs that she's been dragged out the door, and that a rifle that she had loaded and sort of mounted over I guess the counter of her car, uh, hardware store had been used and set down on the counter. And so they're like, well, look, someone's either wounded her or killed her and the body's gone. And her son remembers the local weirdo, Ed Gein, the day before, who had been coming on to his mother. Like when I say coming on, I mean like, would you like to go roller skating or something like that? You know, asking right. a, a woman in her late 50s, this in the 50s it's utterly it's just bizarre but he noted that it was bizarre and ed had been like hey when are you going on your next hunting trip which is where the deputy and her son had been that day and he realizes oh it's probably ed Gein." so to make a long story short they eventually arrest Gein and converge on his house two guys are going in there at night, it's in the middle of winter, so the snow is all on the ground, very quiet. And they enter through what's called the summer kitchen, so like a back, uh, a back area with a door. And as they're moving through the darkness, they bump into something. And they look up, and there is Bernice Warden 
and she's been gutted exactly like a deer dressed out in that way and she's hanging from the rafters and they have a freak out moment they run outside one of them's barfing into the snow while the other one calls for backup and then all these officers from various jurisdictions that i mean they don't have enough people in the local police force to handle this so there's all people pouring in from the surrounding areas they go into ed's house and they find something like you would see on the texas chainsaw massacre he's got skeletal parts uh, body parts that have been preserved in various ways if these are all attributable to murder this guy will have killed something you know, like 20 women minimum and so they don't know what they're dealing with they're just tagging and bagging it they're just processing it during this time they find the missing tavern keeper mary hogan's head in a sack or something like that can't remember exactly but he's made a suit out of ladies body parts so he called it a woman's suit it was like a essentially the skin had all been preserved and the, you know, there was breasts and he had a mask with hair coming out. It would have been hideous. And he would later confess that he would go frolicking in the moonlight dressed in that, which itself is to me much scarier than anything I've seen in those movies. Just that notion. But to tie it all in, obviously you have the mother tells me about the sinfulness of women. She's long past. No, sorry. Um, mother tells me about the sinfulness of women. I live in a big old house by myself. I am kind of psychotic. That's the Norman Bates aspect from Psycho. Right. And then the Texas Chainsaw Massacre aspect is once again, you've got this big old bucolic house run down, but it's filled with body parts and the villain in it wears a dead skin mask, and they are cannibals. And it was rumored that Ed Gein was a cannibal, once again, not proven. And then finally, with Buffalo Bill in Silence of the Lambs, his whole signature is that he skins the women that he abducts after shooting them in the head or killing them otherwise. And he's always picking on larger women because he wants to make a suit a female skin, uh, uh, flesh, so he can transform into a woman, hence the moth motif, because he was denied a sex reassignment surgery. And so just that one case, Ed Gein, that I detail quite a bit in Behind the Horror, inspired Texas Chainsaw Massacre, Psycho, and a large portion of Buffalo Bill's psychopathology in the silence of the lambs however in the silence of the lambs chapter i get into a ton more serial killers because there's more to buffalo bill than just him and of course there's also hannibal lecter he's a play too listeners we're talking here and we'll be speaking i mean for like 45 minutes an hour and there's no way that we can scratch the surface of this entire book so every chapter of your book is, is a serial killer or or these cases that compile these the serial killer things that go into each and every one of these movies. I, there's there without getting political too much. Do you have any thoughts about there seems to be a lot of the cancel culture that doesn't want these kind of movies like uh how do I say it? The Ed Gein making the woman suit, Silence of the Lambs, the guy making a woman suit. Obviously, uh, we need to have inclusivity in our civilization, in our society. Uh, do you have any thoughts about like them trying to not have these movies be available to the public? Yeah, I think they're authoritarian dickheads. Fuck you, stop me. That's my political statement. <laughs> really? How do you really feel? <laughs> I know. I get you, man. I get you. I, I there, there's there's certainly a uh, uh, you know you want to be sensitive to people and their and their real lives, but we're talking about. Uh, we're talking about Hollywood and make believe in movies and characters and escapism and things like that. So there, one doesn't have anything to do with the other. So it, it goes both ways, right? Mm -hmm. I'm not forcing you to watch the film. Yeah, I would never. Okay, right. That's why we have warnings about what the film content includes. Nobody is making you see it. Okay, you're the one who's telling people how they can and can't live their lives. If people want to live as transsexual, transgendered, however you want to phrase it. If people 
want to live whatever lifestyle, as long as they're not violating other people's consent. That was the noble path. That's what we figured out. And it was working pretty good in, say, like the 2000s. And we saw great advancements in rights for for, um, gay people, Mm -hmm. right? And it was agreed upon that this is the path for live and let live. I still abide by that. I'm not on a tribe. Uh, I'm for a set of principles. The minute you start telling other people what they can't do, if it's not directly hurting someone, that you're my enemy. It's just that simple. Sure. I I totally understand that too. With the uh, technology moving towards streaming and things like that, you know, I have a, I back over here in a, in a, in a storage area, I have many, 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 many movies and television shows all on physical media. And uh, I enjoy collecting things on physical media. And it's a little scary to me to think that we're moving to a point where a movie studio or a group of individuals can come into your private movie collection that you have either, you know, like online or streaming or in the cloud, and they can maybe cherry pick or Mm re-edit and take things out of your Mm -hmm. collection that they deem that you're not, you shouldn't, shouldn't watch. So I I think that's, that's pretty dangerous. Well, now's the time to hoard all old media. Yeah, for real. It really is. And save it if you can. And I learned this the hard way when Amazon recently started changing some of the availability of Kindle books. I was like, because honestly, when I was doing research for this book, I was on a very tight deadline and it was during COVID and you know how the mail service slowed down with COVID. I was like, I can't wait for the hard copies of some of these secondary sources to arrive. So I'm going to buy them on my Kindle. And then I realized, wait a second, what do you mean I'm renting these? Like these don't belong to me. Amazon can just revoke this and explain why I paid $20 for it. And they don't want to, uh, they're not going to rebate or give you your refund back. Exactly. So I'm never buying an ebook again. <laughs> so uh, if you're going to get a behind the horror, please get a hard copy of it. Yeah. I mean, there used to be a wisdom about people who ban books, which seems to have been lost. This sort of stuff, Brian, you didn't want to get political. And so I'll just kind of end it here, scares me far more than anything I'm telling you that's happened in this book here. Oh, yeah. No, no. And and when I say non-political, I just don't like mentioning uh, uh, names and and things like that, because so many, so many times, and I've had this conversation with other people on the show, uh, I've had psychotherapists on the show, and we talk about how politicians display narcissistic tendencies and sociopathic tendencies and and, and that's just the way the political uh, machine is working nowadays. The people that are gravitating toward that usually have those tendencies. And, oh, uh, yeah. you know, so. <laughs> yeah, there's that. But you asked the question. No, I figured no. I would just. No, man, we're uh, talking. We're talking. We're adults here. <laughs> well, we don't have all day. So I just figured I'd get to the point. And my <laughs> patience for it is getting increasingly uh, shorter. Well, and you're, and you're on, you know, you're a researcher and you're a writer and you have a, a wealth of information with your educational experience and everything too. So I, I figured it, it would be remiss of me not, not to ask your opinion, especially as a working writer and writing books and especially about some top topics that people might find uncomfortable. So I appreciate you sharing that with me. Yeah. So if you're worried about the contents of this book here, it contains graphic descriptions of violence sometimes sexual violence. It was worse before the editor went to it. I even said to the editor, do what you think is prudent. You're the guys paying me the money. Right. I want you to be happy with the product. So they did what they thought was prudent with that. Uh, there are stories of the paranormal in here. There are stories of uh, people being ripped apart by sharks. Uh, I talk about the Salem witch trials. There's all kinds of stuff in here that may offend you. If you're the kind of person who's easily frightened or offended, I would not recommend this book for you. And that way I can write it and people who aren't like you can read it. And there's absolutely no scientific studies that show that them consuming that makes them more likely to hurt you. And you, the sensitive person, can go and read uh, something more PG. (laughs) 
<laughs> See how it works? <laughs> Isn't it, it's, a, it's a beautiful thing, Lee. <laughs> Yeah, I don't want it, the book to hurt you, so don't read it. Right, right. And I think most of the people that would tune in and listen to this show and find uh, the contents of this show throughout the the uh, history of the episodes and everything will 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 enjoy it for what it is. It's historical, mm-hmm. and like I said at the beginning of the show, I like how you tie in these um, these these inspirations to the movie itself. And you just mentioned a second ago uh, people being ripped apart by sharks. Yeah, that's a good chapter. Yeah, yeah, it is. And uh, my favorite horror movie, and in fact, my favorite movie of all time is Jaws. I, I, I watch it every 4th of July weekend, and I have for, since I can remember, since I was able to get it on uh, on VHS. And now I have multiple copies. So speaking of physical copies, I have multiple copies on DVD. I've got the Blu-ray. I've got the 4K. You know, I mean, it's just my favorite movie. And so uh, reading about the, uh, the New Jersey shark attacks of 1916. Um, I've read other books that delve into that case, but man, the New Jersey shark attacks of, of 1916 that inspired Peter Benchley to write Jaws. Uh, you, you do a great job of documenting all of that and talking about um, just the just the terror that happened back then over 100 years ago. Yeah, well, first of all, Brian, you are obviously a true cinephile because I love cinema myself. And so after I'd finished writing the book, I went back and I watched every movie in the book and I ranked them, you know, which one is better because I thought I knew in my head. Yeah. And I believe that the crowning horror movie was going to likely be either The Exorcist or Psycho, both of which are, uh, you know, amazing, incredible cinematic masterworks. And to my surprise, when all was said and done, it was Jaws sitting atop of that list because Jaws does not have a wasted moment in it. No. It is beautifully shot. The dialogue is always on point. There's no fat. The characters are great. It is genuinely tense. And I think it affected people psychologically and truly horrified them far more than any of these other films. Like, you might watch The Exorcist and go through a period of your life where you're afraid of demonic possession or you entertain it. But the amount of people, including myself, who are reluctant to go into the water because of the film Jaws, I think it's, uh, we could call it and you know forgive the use of the word, especially in these times, we could call it a bit of a pandemic. It didn't affect everyone, but it affected enough people around the world after seeing that film that, you know, Once upon a time, we might have gone happily playing in the sea, and now you stop and you think every time the 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 (laughs) right. So, um, with that, yeah, excellent taste in film. I agree with you. I don't know if I'd say it's my favorite film, but it was my favorite horror film. So it's going to be close. Yeah, the nineteen sixteen shark attacks in New Jersey. So it's around the season where these little New Jersey beachside communities open up for the summer. And this is really where they make all their money. They have hotels, they have restaurants. And so it's a very seasonal community, just like Amity Island in Jaws. And the guy goes there, he's in the ocean, fit dude, suddenly ripped apart by a shark. And then it happens again. And so they're like, well, you know, we can't close this. So they start putting up these shark nets, trying to watch and out and monitor. And this sort of sets the tone for Jaws. But in real life, what happens is there's a creek called Matawan Creek. And while everyone's watching the ocean to make sure that the shark isn't picking off the people who are going swimming in this resort community, there's little kids playing in the fresh water of Matawan Creek, as they've always done, cool swimming holes, little boys going, you know, jumping in and wrestling with each other. And then one of the little boys is dragged under. And the others just go, what happened to him? I think they see a fin or something and they go running into town. They tell everyone. And then a young man who is engaged to be married, 
he runs out and he jumps in trying to save this kid. He's not sure about the shark. He thinks he just might be caught on something or drowning. You know, there's a lot of confusion. Like, what the hell is a shark doing in the creek? And then this guy gets taken out too. In the meantime, there's an old uh, captain of a vessel who is going along this creek and he sees a big fin. And so he's going back to town to warn everyone, but he's the crazy old kooky captain and everyone's half paying attention to him. So th- what you get is the Jersey man eaters. That's what they call it. And I think it was something within 16 days or 18 days that this, um, and they didn't even know if it was the sh- same shark. They just reasonably assumed it was, had chewed up all these people. And so the people of the Matawan Creek area, they were out for vengeance. And just like you see in the movie Jaws, they've got explosives and they're lobbing it into the sea and they're killing all these sharks. And during this time, there's a taxidermist in New York and he's just, he's more curious about this kind of shark fervor, these people that are going out destroying all these sharks, trying to get the Jersey man eater. That's what he's curious about. And so he goes out with someone who owns a a vessel, can't remember their profession, to go and watch these guys. Mm -hmm. And while they're out, they decide to do a little fishing. While they're fishing, they hook this huge shark. And it's like Jaws, you know, the boat is straining against it. And he manages to pull some clever moves and he ensnares it. And this taxidermist beats it to death with an oar, which... Man, unless there's something I don't know about sharks, this guy must be very strong to to beat a shark to death with an oar. But they bring it in and they empty the stomach contents. And generally, it's believed that this is the Jersey man eater and he's consumed all of these people. But it's not a consensus to this day. You know, there's people that take either side of it. But those shark attacks stop at this point. And that there is, I obviously get into a lot more detail and specifics in the book, but that's just one of three sections that I use for the Jaws chapter. I also talk about how the character of Quint was based on a shark hunter called Frank Lundus, who operated on Long Island and who he was and his adventures and, the things about Quint that were inspired by Frank Lundus. And I also talk about the USS Indianapolis, which was sunk by a Japanese torpedo in the latter days of the second world war in the Pacific and how the crew were just left stranded in the Pacific ocean exposed to the elements and just how terrible that was. But then you threw in the sharks at the same time. And that's something that that Quint talks about and one of the most unforgettable scenes in the Jaws film when they're comparing tattoos. Yeah. I'm sure you're familiar with that one. Oh yeah. When Robert Shaw gives that, that yeah. performance of that, it, it, it makes the movie right there. Cause you are totally drawn in. There's no music, you know, it's just him, the tight shot, well lit, super scary. Um, yeah. The, the, you know, setting the scene back in 1916, the, you know, the, the scientists at the time really doubted, at the time that it was some sharks can't do that. Sharks aren't powerful enough to do that. You know, the ichthyologists at the time weren't convinced that it was, it, it was a shark that, that injured these bathers. <laughs> you know, you know mm-hmm. what I mean? And then, like you said, it, you know, the shark found its way down this Creek and these boys were swimming and Lester Stillwell was attacked and, and his body uh, drugged down to the bottom of the creek. And these boys were so scared that they, you know, they were skinny dipping because, you know, it was 1916. Yeah. They, they're, they're running through town naked, trying to get anybody to listen to him, anybody to help. And like you said, the kind of the crazy guy that saw the fin and then, and then the gentleman that jumps into the water trying to locate the body. And then he now gets that you attacked. mentioned it, there, there was a, uh, another boy that was killed yes. during that time. No, he was seriously injured. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And he was just at another part of the creek playing with his brother and yeah. it got him too. That's why I kind of lost count oh, when sorry. I had more recently had the book in memory. I could have, you know, told you exactly how many, but there are so many that the shark kills. It's, it's like which ones survived and which ones died. It, 
yeah, it's an incredible story. And you're right. They were just in doubt about it. And that it gets expressed in the movie Jaws somewhat uh, when he says, if you yell Barracuda, everyone goes, huh? What? Like, what's the big deal? If you yell Shark, you have a panic on your hands on the 4th of July. That's the mayor's saying in the movie. Mm -hmm. But in a way... There is that thought that, you know, it could be something like a barracuda. There are other things in the water that could do this. And um, even though the popular conception is shark is the worst, there's plenty of things in the deep that can harm you. Yeah. So yeah, I get where you're coming from there. Amity's a summer town. They need the summer dollars. Yeah, I got the whole, yeah. mo- I got the whole movie up here. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so I was like, it's a good one to have. Right. Right. Yeah. So I was really happy that you included it in your book as being something that inspired a horror movie, because it's one of the, it's a terrible chapter in New Jersey or East coast or even American history that, uh, mm. that Peter Benchley masterfully put into his book. So, uh, you, you've got some, um, there's, there's tons of murder stories in your book and, and those are great too, but I, I'm glad that you touched on some of the paranormal stories like uh, with these kind of these newer movies like The Conjuring and and things yeah. like that. So you you wrote about some of these poltergeist stories that inspired these Conjuring movies and whatnot. And I was glad to see that you also kind of are not of the mind that everything is demonic and ghostly because sometimes, sometimes uh, there's a little bit of shenanigans with... Uh, <laughs> with 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 uh, the with these reported hauntings and that's important for a show that um delves a lot with the paranormal like mine that there are sometimes uh questions about whether or not these things are are uh factual or not so uh like you write about the Enfield poltergeist and 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 the um, Seaford poltergeist that inspired the Conjuring movies and also Poltergeist another Poltergeist another great Spielberg film well Toby Hooper yeah. but Spielberg yeah, it was billed as Tobey Hooper, but from what I've heard is Steven Spielberg really did it. Right. Um, Tobey Hooper, of course, was the director of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, not taking anything away from him. No, nope. nope, but Spielberg's all over that flick, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it definitely has more kind of that over-the-top magical Spielberg feel than the more subtle uh, rawness of a Hooper flick. So, yeah, I mean, there was a lot of paranormal stuff I put in there. I believe the first paranormal story, we could call it this, it's really demonic possession. It's the exorcist. And so I looked at the case of Roland Doe, Mm. and that's a pseudonym. We would never know this boy's name, but he was determined to be possessed by the Catholic Church. I think he lived in Connecticut or somewhere around there, if I remember correctly, at the time. And uh, was eventually taken to like, a Jesu- Jesuit hospital in Missouri. And they spent all this time doing these exorcism rituals on him. And there was a book written about that. But like, so it definitely happened. There's files on it, but there was definitely a code of silence over it. The, the Catholic Church is not open about when it does choose to perform an exorcism. It rarely does opt to have that option. And so for that reason, I think people are inclined to believe in it. It's like, well, they seem to be thinking really critically about this. People underestimate seemingly the ability of a motivated, clever child to fool experts, be they religious, um, scientific, in the police, they can do it. And you see that with the Herman family case in uh, Long Island, which inspired Poltergeist. They had all these police and parapsychologists coming and going and witnessing things, going flying across rooms and lids on bottles popping off and... uh, there's no explanation for this. And with the Enfield haunting in London, which was the conjuring too, same deal. You've got police coming in, you've got parapsychologists trying to figure out what's going on here. Uh, This little girl seems to be possessed. There's levitation photos, there's things moving around. And in all three of these cases, 
it's very interesting because it seems to be that the child was just an amazing trickster, you know, using sleight of hand and just playing on the gullibility of people who I think wanted to believe this to some extent. And there is this one character that ties both the Herman case, which inspired Poltergeist, and the Enfield haunting of The Conjuring 2 together. And his name was Milburn Christopher. And Milburn Christopher was a stage magician. You know, he's like a something like David Blaine or probably closer to like a James Randi type sure. of, of that era. And like most stage uh, magicians, he would always say, look, this isn't really ma- magic, right? I'm not going to tell you how I did it, but it's not real. Yeah. Slide of hand, illusion. Sure. It's my tricks. And so these guys tend to be very skeptical because for them, they're being transparent. Like, uh, yeah, I can do all these things that could make you believe I'm magic, but I'm telling you I'm not. It's not magic. And so when somebody is doing those sorts of tricks and then claiming that they are magic, these people who I would say are very moral people are apt to go, okay, let me take a look. And it's telling that in the case of the Enfield haunting, Milburn Christopher found evidence that the girl was pulling a trick. And he was like, I've, you know, I figured it out. So for him, it was done while it continued with everyone else. And the Hermans before that, he was one of two people that they wouldn't let anywhere near their kids. So Milburn Christopher wanted to go into the Herman family household and just take a look and see what was going on. They wouldn't allow him. And the other person they wouldn't allow was a polygraph uh, examiner, you know, so subject the children and the family to lie detection tests. And one of the interesting things is Milburn Christopher had gone in to see one of the parapsychologists who was baffled by the Herman family poltergeist case. And while he was in his office, he was making the same tricks happen that was going on in the house. Like, see? Yeah, there was that. They didn't, they didn't, they didn't want the magician in there and they didn't, uh, they didn't want the um, lie detector test being utilized either. Exactly. And then suddenly, what would you know uh, when the polygraph test is, uh, is put on the table? No, we, we don't want that. And suddenly the poltergeist activity just stops. This house is clean. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And then like there's the Amityville horror, which is in there too. Right. Right. And that guy, uh, the, well, the, the murderer Del Feo. Yeah. Ron DeFeo just died. Yeah. He just died. Yeah. Yeah. The murder is very real. Oh yeah. Right. That actually took place. The haunting of, is it 112 ocean? Mm -hmm. I think it is. Yeah. Total BS. And that has been determined through multiple lawsuits found against the Lutzes, who uh, were George and Kathy Lutz. I think they're both now deceased. And they kind of got together, I think it was a, with a lawyer, one day after moving out of the house and over several bottles of wine, said, you know, we can really cash in on this. Let's write a book about it. and. You know, maybe you'll get picked up by a movie company. And the, it's, it's a good book. I had to read the book because that was their telling of the events. Yeah. And yeah, a great read. Not a bad movie either. I don't know how well it's aged. I found that, yeah, uh, like I'd seen it before and not quite as powerful for me as some of the others. But the couple were completely full of it. And you will find in the cases of people who are completely full of it, another couple called Ed and Lorraine Warren, who were involved in the Conjuring films yeah. and uh, in the Amityville horror. And yeah, total charlatans. And yeah. if I didn't think so, like I have no invested interest in, in you know, telling you this. 
I don't care what you believe. Oh, oh no. no. Like, and Lorraine Warren, there's, there's a lot of theories that like, even the the Annabelle was, uh, they kind of dreamt that up after watching a particular episode of Twilight Zone. I mean, there's theories about that. So, you know, there's a precursor, Robert the doll, which I didn't Mm -hmm. really look into, but there's a Robert the doll that comes before that. And then Annabelle, you can see is going into Chucky, right? Like the haunted doll. Correct. Yeah, I've had Don, I've had Don Mancini on the show talking about uh, uh, Chucky and things like that, but but there were there, awesome. there's theories about uh, there there's there's a episode of the Twilight Zone where I'm trying to remember where the name Annabelle's in there, and she might have got there might be some inspiration for Annabelle, their story, the doll, the haunt the hauntedness of the doll from from a, from an episode of Twilight Zone. I'll have to look onto that and report back. Uh, to the listeners, the Necronomic has, but man, I'm, I'm just took, I'm looking through these contents and people, you got to check out this book because if you like horror movies or true crime, this is the perfect marriage of the two. We've got, we've got psycho frenzy. We've got these great Hitchcock movies, jaws, exorcist, the town that dreaded sundown, Amityville, serpent of the rainbow with zombies. Scream. That was a cool chapter. Yeah. That, that, that one in it's the Mothman movie. prophecies. Yeah. 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 It, it is a great movie. Uh, when on the rewatch, I was like, Whoa, cool. I should have given that more attention. But um, the serpent and the rainbow and the Mothman prophecies, they were like two things that were entirely different than the others. So I kind of had like the serial killer set or, you know, the murder set. Mm -hmm. And then I had the paranormal set. And then the occasional monster thing like Jaws, right? And... The Mothman prophecies and the Serpent and the Rainbow, we're looking at, in the Serpent and the Rainbow, a real-life ethnobotanist and anthropologist who travels to Haiti. Completely true story, no BS here. Under contract of a pharmaceutical company to figure out what it is that is seemingly allowing voodoo doctors to turn people into zombies and following on a case of a guy who claims to have been a zombie and everyone thinks is a zombie. Right. This really happened. So that was such a delight to write that chapter and research that because it's like, now I'm learning about what different plants and drugs do and hallucinogens. And I'm learning about the voodoo culture of Haiti with like a sprinkle of Duvalier's regime and all that. Uh, very, very powerful chapter. And with the Mothman prophecies, like you could say that's paranormal. Uh, and I guess it would be, but not in the same way. It's not ghosts and demons. It's some sort of strange entities, which uh, like w- seemingly <laughs> visited this town yeah. of Point Pleasant. West Virginia in 1966 and 67. And I didn't even have room to get into the men in black that came in to ask questions about it after I didn't have room in the book to cover that part, Um, which wasn't in the Mothman prophecies film either. Right. So writing that one, honestly, that was a psychedelic experience writing that one. I'm typing it all out and, the Mothman and the red eyes and the bridge collapsing and Indrid cold, you know, standing there grinning in the headlights and I will come and visit you at your house telekinetically. And then researching the men in black and just going, I didn't take anything, but I feel like I'm on drugs (laughs) writing this. I kind of felt like I was on drugs reading it too. (laughs) That's that's called a job well done. Yeah. Right. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Nice job. So, so with this fantastic book that you've written, uh, now you, at the beginning of the program, you were, uh, talking about you, um, you, you were writing a book about conspiracies coming up and, and is that out or are you writing it now? I'm sorry. Yeah, no, it's out. Uh, conspiracies uncovered. It's by the same publisher. I love it. I love both of these books. Uh, I don't get royalties by the way. So if they don't sell, eh, it doesn't make a difference in my bank account. <laughs> I want you to buy them sure. because they're great. And I both had a really tight, I, sorry, I had a tight deadline on both of them at about like three months for this one and like two and a half for conspiracies uncovered. So just 24, seven days, just bang, 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 just go, go, go. And that surreal experience that I got writing the 
Mothman chapter of this was almost the entirety of Conspiracies Uncovered, which starts with a chapter called Them, which is all about the various secret societies and unfortunately, in the case of the Jews, ethnic groups, Mm -hmm. which have been blamed for masterminding conspiracies, you know, the things they don't want you to know or they're pulling the strings. I go through the Rosicrucians, I go through the Illuminati, Freemasons, CIA, Russian uh, intelligence, all that. But then it goes right into the end of the Second World War. And we start with Nazis getting out of the country via these rat lines, which are being facilitated. And here's the conspiracy. We know that members of the Catholic Church were involved in smuggling them out because hundreds of war criminals made it to Argentina and other parts of South America. The question is, how much were the upper echelons of the Catholic Church involved? Right. And so I try to be as honest about that as I am with the haunting stuff. I just do my best to you know, make kind of both cases. And I usually tilt it in the direction where, where I'm looking at it, but I leave it up to you. Tied in with that, did Hitler get out? I mean, there's, <laughs> yeah, you know, it's it's almost something like you you just go. Obviously, Hitler didn't make it out, but there's stronger evidence for it than you would think. I still don't think he did, but it's worth a look. It starts with that, and then it goes all through Area 51, the Men in Black. So it touches on Mothman again, a little intersection there. Yeah. And then through the Kennedy assassination, MK Ultra to the RFK assassination, to the moon landing hoax, or as some people would have it, the flat earth theory to is the harp facility uh, being used along with chemtrails to make sky quakes and Hurricane Katrina. And, you know, the, the, the madness then continues into the modern age, which is every bit as crazy as the 60s with uh, was Seth Rich killed for linking DNC, uh, wow. sorry, leaking DNC emails to WikiLeaks or was it the government? And then they took out my Pizzagate chapter at the last minute, which was interesting. I'll just leave it at that. Okay. But you can listen to the Pizzagate chapter on my show, Murder Was the Case, episode 192. Nice. So if, yeah, I just read out what I had written. And then Jeffrey Epstein, um, oh. not only you know did he kill himself or or not, But also, was there more to him? Was he a spy? Was he working for intelligence? And then ending on COVID nineteen. Wow! So I didn't I didn't know it was that modern or that that current. So let's let's get on that one sometime. Yeah, let's do that. (laughs) I'm I'm super excited. Yeah, right now I'm reading a very. uh, It's a it's a good book. It's a fantastic book. But I'm reading uh, a Mark Lane's book about uh, the Kennedy assassination. Uh, rush to judgment, and that's a conspiracy conspiracy theory. But it has nothing to do with, with uh, a, a lot of these uh, uh, other conspiracy theories that that you've kind of laid out in this new book. And and if people want to get your book, I'm sure they can get it at any place that they usually get books. But what is your website in case people want to uh, start exploring you specifically? Yeah, leemeller dot com. So l e e m e l l o r dot com. I guess I should update it. I've wrote two books last year, so, you know, I just get behind on things. Um, yeah, if you like me as a character, listen to my podcast, Murder Was the Case. It has a medium but very loyal listenership, and I don't play PC. I uh, shoot straight from the hip. That's what podcasts are for, though, I think, you know? You know, if you want something scrubbed down and sparkly clean, then, you know, there's places you can get that. But if you want to get directly in touch with uh, with people as they construct ideas, I think that's what's great about podcasts or what, what has the great potential for podcasts. You know, you can uh, you can specif- specify what kind of things you want to listen to and really what kind of yeah. hosts or shows, uh, you know, tickle your fancy. That's it. It's a free expression as revolution. And if you don't like the host or you don't like the content or both don't listen. There's plenty others out there. Everyone gets a voice, right? right. To come back to what we were saying, rather than only this small cadre of people tells everyone else what they can't say and what they can say and what they must listen to. You can be on that side or you can be on the side of everyone gets a voice and everyone gets a choice to which voices they listen to. I've, 
firmly in the latter camp. I as well. Lee, having you on the program has been has been a treat, man. And I, I really appreciate the way that you've uh, that you express yourself. I appreciate uh, you know, the the information that you put out. I've listened to some of your tunes too, man. Get back into music. Yeah. I, I don't think you you said you were in your twenties really into it. Uh, do you still record now or put stuff together now? Music to me is my religion in that it solves problems. It's a form of meditation. It's a form of prayer. It, uh, the songs are miracles, like good ones, sky songs. That's what they call them, right? They kind of come to you. Yeah. And the way that music and the music industry work, it was like I was debasing my spirituality uh, by combining those two things. Mm. And so in order to save my quote unquote faith, you know, the closest thing I have to it, Mm -hmm. I walked away from doing it professionally, trying to make it all these ego driven ideas around it because I wanted to keep it. And we'll just end with a friend of the family recently passed away and he had a huge guitar collection. And the widow doesn't want the guitars around because it just reminds her too much of him. And so I went and I took a look at them and there's everything. There's a Telecaster, there's a Strat, there's, you know, uh, Epiphone, Les Paul, there's banjos, there's 12 stringers. And I just thought, you know, maybe it would be good for both of us if I just kind of bit the bullet and wrote a big check and then just get back into it. Yeah. So that's a very distinct possibility. Well, Lee, I've had a great time talking to you and I want to thank you for being a, a part of the Necronomicast. And I want to thank you for being a friend of the program and uh, great work with everything that you've done, man. And, and I really, really enjoyed speaking to you this evening. And I know it was a little goofy getting our uh, time zones all, all, all figured yeah. out from uh, <laughs> Liverpool. Yeah, to- switched. Yeah, from five hours to four hours, that's going back to five, yeah. <laughs> but we got it done, man. Two educated men got it put together. Yeah, how did we work that out? <laughs> We're supposed to be totally inept. Right. Yeah. I'm, I'm glad we did, man. Everybody, <laughs> it's been my pleasure to have Dr. Lee Miller on the program. I will have links to all the information that you need uh, to get in touch with uh, the great works that he's that he's uh, put out there in the public, public arena. So, Lee, thanks so much for your time, my man. Yeah, great uh, meeting and talking with you, Brian, and we will do this again. There we are, kids. Episode number 199 is in the can. Dr. Lee Meller. What a great guy. Super interesting to talk to. Way more educated than I am, but I think I did a good job. His book is fantastic. You know, when we put the show together originally years ago, it was all about horror movies and things that inspired him. Well, he wrote the book on it, so there you go. All right, kids, big show announcement. What's going on for episode 200? 10 years in the making. Episode 200 will come out in a couple weeks and it'll be my conversation with Nick Groff. Nick Groff, you'll know him from Ghost Adventures back in the day, Ghosts of Shepherdstown, his new show, Death Walker. It's coming out on Discovery Plus. We're going to talk all about it and his unique insight, not only into investigating the paranormal, but the philosophies of life and what drives him as a man, as a human on this planet Earth, on this blue dot we call Earth. So I am very excited to bring that to you. That's episode 200 of the Necronomicast. And as always, If you could please be so kind as to leave a review for the show over at iTunes, YouTube, become a member, a subscriber, I would be forever in love and in your debt to each and every one of you. So until then, take care. God bless us all. Go get some sleep.